So uh, welcome everyone to one of the GraspPods academic workshops uh, for the summer, uh, which we have Michael here. Uh, he's a science communicator and coordinator for SciCats, which is a science, science communication action team. Uh, they're a team of science communicators here in Vancouver that have created a lot of teaching modules um, that span a range of science communication topics to improve the dialogue, um, improve dialogue and knowledge translation. Um, and today he'll be discussing how to give a good online presentation. Um, with that, uh, Michael, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, that's uh, come here uh, on their lunch break. Looks like we got about 19 participants. Uh, this is fun. Uh, this is a uh, brand new uh, presentation, a workshop that SciCats, um, the Science Communication Action Team uh, something. We kind of added the S in there. Uh, we couldn't figure out uh, what the extra S was going to be, so we just added uh, something. Uh, but uh, we are a team of science communicators, and we all have uh, day jobs that involve us uh, being in science communication. And we developed this module. This is all brand new for 2020. It used to be just sort of like general science communication tips. Um, but because now everything is trans transitioned online, um, this is now the new world that we live in. So what we're gonna do for the next 45 minutes, uh, I would love this to be interactive. It's a small group, so we actually could actually um, have a nice little conversation. That's what we do uh, in science communication. Uh, it is having a conversation rather than me just speaking. Now I could just talk for 45 minutes. Uh, I would love to hear uh, from uh, some of you uh, as we go along. But it's gonna be basically three sections that uh, we're gonna delve into. So the first part, uh, I'm gonna talk about some digital tips. This is all stuff that I've had to learn in the past two months. <laughs> I did not know about Zoom in February. Uh, and by the end of March, uh, you know, I, I was I was not an expert, but I was well well versed in the Zoomiverse. Uh, then we're going to get into audience, and audience is a, is one of the core uh, teaching modules that we have uh, at SciCats. So we're going to delve into that, and then we're going to finish off with some presentation planning, which is um, also kind of like core um, public speaking, online speaking, how to make a good presentation. A great presentation. Now, I'd love to sort of like just see in the chat if people want to put in there, um, you know, do you have a presentation coming up? Have you been giving presentations recently? Um, is this something that uh, you're thinking about? Um, I'd also love to uh, hear about, you know, maybe what you're studying. Um, and uh, that helps me sort of understand you as we'll get into uh, to our audience tips. So, yeah, just throw into the chat. Um, um, if you've got a presentation coming up or anything like that, um, would love to hear from you. So, I work at the Space Center, the H. R. McMillan Space Center. Uh, hopefully you've heard of it before. Uh, you can't come to the Space Center right now because we are closed, uh, as most uh, museums are, although there are some that are opening back up again. Uh, so, in the middle of March, we closed our doors and we transitioned all of our programs online. I couldn't come into work anymore. I had to bring a couple laptops and all of a sudden I had to set up uh, here in my kitchen. Uh, and we do online programs um, for adults, for kids. I were live on, on YouTube. We basically became a TV show. Now the thing is that I love science TV shows uh, and this is something that I've always kind of wanted to do, but at the Space Center, that's not what we have done. So all of a sudden we had to relearn all of these things and a lot of it is very technical. Uh, and it was frustrating because learning something new for the first time is not fun. And especially when you're sort of well versed in um, doing something, getting in front of a crowd and, and talking with them, having a conversation. And it's difficult to have conversations online. Do I like it? No, I don't like it. <laughs> I would much rather be there in person with you so I could see all of you and I could interact with you. Uh, to be honest, it's a bit surreal to be sitting in my kitchen, looking at my uh, computer screen and having to uh, educate people in this way. But it's the world that we live in and we have to adapt. And this is what scientists do is, you know, as we get new information, we have to we have to adapt. And so in all of the things that I do and all the things listed here, uh, Nerd Night Vancouver was another thing. I'm not, I'm not sure if any of you have ever come to a Nerd Night before. It used to be at the Fox uh, Cabaret on Main Street. 
we have transitioned to a podcast called Nerdin' About. Uh, that was sort of like a pivot that we did. At some point, maybe Nerd Night will come back. We can be back at the Fox. Uh, but if you're into podcasts, you can check out Nerdin' About. Uh, Psycats, of course, you know about. The Lower Mainly is more Mainland Museum Educators, Canadian Association of Science Centers, Canadian Satellite Design Challenge. All of those things just dropped. And now we are now online. So that's the world that we live in. So let's get going here with the basics. So you've got your laptop, you've got your microphone, or maybe you don't have a microphone. Um, the thing here is that you want to have headphones to separate your audio that's going into your computer and the audio that's coming out of your computer. Okay, so here's a little thing uh, about computers. It's pretty basic. Maybe some of you already know this, but I've got a MacBook Air and it's got a built-in microphone in it. And it's also got the speakers and those located almost, almost right next to each other. So when the audio is coming out of your computer, say you're having a conversation with somebody on FaceTime, uh, occasionally you may have heard some like that weird feedback that kind of happens, kind of pops in. And that's your computer actually trying to adjust. It's trying to figure out what is the uh what audio should it be picking up is it the audio that's coming out of the speaker or is it the audio that's coming out of my mouth and sometimes you get some of like those weird feedback because it's trying to adjust so the really easy way to solve that is just to put in some earphones so that the audio coming out of your computer is not going to go back into the microphone now uh a lot of um really basic uh uh mac uh headphones like this they have uh, microphones attached. Uh, since uh, we've transitioned to a podcast, I now um, got one of these uh, microphones here, which is a, a Q2U. There's many different versions out there. That's something that I just did for myself. We were doing a lot of uh, online things. Not totally necessary. If you're not doing online things, you don't need to get a, basic, a fancy microphone like this. Sometimes just the microphone cup that's attached to your headphones will work just fine enough. But if just the simple act of putting in some headphones will reduce some of that feedback. Um, especially in like a group meeting, it gets even more complicated. And I don't know if any of you have been in group meetings before and, you're, and people are trying to talk over each other. So that's another added layer. Zoom is now trying to figure out, okay, who's talking? Whose uh, audio should we be trying to pick up? And then all of a sudden, you know, somebody's uh, uh, got their got their microphone on and a car drives by and then all of a sudden Zoom fix, thinks that that person wants to talk and it's, it's wild, uh, not fun. Um, another thing, really simple, set up your laptop, which is now your camera, and you have to think of this in a way that this is your audience now that you're speaking to and they want to see you in your best light. So if you're gonna give a presentation up on a stage in front of a bunch of people, like myself, you get those little nervous butterflies. Um, and what do you do? You kind of, when you want to give yourself a little bit of confidence, you look your best. You go into the bathroom, you do your hair, put on your nice shirt and tie, and you're like, okay, now I'm ready to do this. But just because you're sitting in your living room or in your kitchen, doesn't mean that you shouldn't also look your best. And the best way to do that is to set up your laptop in front of a window or your light source. Now, maybe you're in a room that doesn't have a window. Um, it, the best thing is not to have any top-down lighting. You wanna have lighting that's hitting your face. Now, if you don't, if you don't have any options like that, um, you, know, you can adapt. Right now, I'm sitting in front of a window, so all of the natural light is hitting my face. Now, if, I was, if it was the reverse, if the window was behind me, you would get all of this backlit stuff and all of a sudden you can't see my face anymore and you're looking at me, but all you can, all you see is uh, this white light, very distracting. So in a very simple act, just put your um, laptop, um, it's a really simple thing, um, put it in front of the window because natural light is even better than any kind of light you can have, okay? No backlight. Second thing, as you can see uh, in this diagram, uh, we have our, our figure sitting and he's got his laptop stacked, on some, uh, stacked up on some books because you want to raise up your camera so that it is at eye level, right? Consider, remember, your audience uh, is looking at you and when you're sitting across, say if you were sitting across from someone, you're not going to, you wouldn't be sitting, uh, sitting there like this, you know, talking to someone. That's really weird and awkward. You want to be sitting up and you want to be looking directly at them. 
but our laptops are small. And most of the ways that we are doing these online talks is through our laptops. Maybe you have a webcam, uh, maybe you have another source uh, that you're doing, but just take some books. Um, I've got a little stand. I've actually got a Star Trek Catan box. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to play Star Trek Catan, I haven't played in a while. It's a really fun game. But right now I'm using it as a, um, as a booster to get my laptop so I'm right there at eye level. Okay, because the last thing you want is someone looking up your nose and all of a sudden you forgot that you've got some nose hairs up there. Again, you want to look your best. You don't want people distracted um, uh, in certain ways. Now, as we're going through all of this, you know, I would highly encourage you uh, practice. Uh, practice your setup in there. Like, look around your room. Look at where your light is. And don't be afraid. Like, uh, play around with it. Uh, we're gonna. Get, if you have any questions as we go along, um, please. This is our chance to kind of just talk about your setup and improving your setup. Uh, and now's your time to practice. This is a safe place. I'm not judging anyone uh, about any of their setups. Uh, would just love to uh, to get you guys to practice. Um, so talking about eye level and. What we're really talking about here is something called the golden ratio, uh, which I'm not sure if anyone uh, is familiar with the golden ratio, but basically it's just sort of like basic principles of pleasing aesthetics. Now, if you want to apply that to beauty, there's some philosophers that are unsure about that, but there's some really basic principles here that is all about thirds. And you can sort of see um, our screen here is divided uh, into thirds. And what we want to do is we want to get, we don't want to have our eye level on the bottom third here. That's a bit weird. Even here is not that great. I want to get my eyes and you certainly don't want, you know, just don't want to be up here. Um, to be honest, I've actually seen uh, well-respected professors. I gave one, I saw one guy give an interview and his, and his eyes were up here. I'm not sure what he was doing. Uh, but we're all figuring this out together. Um, you want to get your eyes right there on that third. Okay? This is, uh, it's just like, it's a golden ratio. This is something that the ancient Greeks had sort of figured out and photographers and many people, they look in nature and they understand these, uh, these basic uh, appealing aesthetic things. Um, and for your zoom, just get right there. I don't got much uh, headroom over here. I've just got my eyes looking right at you. Next thing is we can set up our zoom. If this is your first time, I'm sure this is not your first time in zoom, but you can play with your view. Now, if you click, if you look on the top right corner, you see that there was a speaker view and perhaps some of you have me in speaker view right now, which because I'm the main person uh, talking, that will probably be the, the option you choose. But if it's more of a group meeting, uh, you could maybe do gallery view. Um, if you haven't played around with those features, play around with that because then you see uh, everyone that's there in the meeting. But for the most part, because a lot of you don't have your cameras on uh, and we're, this isn't quite a discussion yet, although maybe we will get to a discussion a little bit later on, you could uh, go to that um, oh, over here. Nope, why am I going over here? There we are. <laughs> over in the, uh, in the top right corner and you can, play, you can play around with that with that view. The other tip is when you are speaking, is that you want to look into the camera, not at, I'm gonna play around, I'm gonna move my box over here. So now over on the, on the right side of the screen is where all the people are, my screen is in the middle, but you can see now, it looks like I'm looking past the, uh, the camera here. I'm not even looking at you folks anymore. So what you can do is once you're in screen sharing mode, now a little box uh, comes up that has all of the, the camera views. I can just move it right into the middle top part of my screen. So if I do want to look at some of you folks, um, I can, and it looks like I'm still looking right at the camera. Uh, another tip, uh, because quite often we get very fascinated with just looking at ourselves. It's a very natural thing when you're uh, having a FaceTime call and you're talking to someone, but then you end up just looking at yourself and you're like, oh boy, do I look tired. You know, I should have worn a different shirt today. Really good tip. I'm gonna do that right now, actually, because I forgot to do this before. There on the top right corner, uh, so there's a three little ellipses in your box and there's a little option that says hide self view. 
So you're still on camera. You can like, if you want to still be on camera, you want people to see you, but you don't want to see yourself, you can just hide yourself view. Now, of course, in this group meeting might not be uh, as applicable, but certainly when you're giving a talk, um, that's a little, a little tip so that you don't get so fascinated by just looking uh, at yourself. You can do it, you can hide the self view. Though. Okay. Uh, and of course here, um, you can also full screen up in the top right corner that you can play around with your Zoom view. Uh, again, I uh, highly encourage people to uh, try that out if you have not. Okay. So there's many options um, for doing these kinds of things at the Space Center. We use Microsoft Teams. Uh, honestly, I don't love it. Um, there's other options out there. Um, there's actually many, many options that I keep learning about. I just used one called Big Marker the other day, um, or oh, there was a new one that we just, uh, just played around with. Um, Zoom is kind of, it was the one that got the most popularity. Um, but there's other options. We can go uh, Facebook Live, you can go to YouTube Live, uh, you can go Instagram Live, all of these different things. I'm not gonna get into the specifics of them, I kind of just focus on Zoom because that's where we are here. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of the specifics of any of these things? Are you using any of these tools right now? Um, if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat there. I, mean, I haven't even looked at the chat here, so let me just have a quick little peek. Uh, Beth, you're preparing for a Zoom teaching interview this week. All right, good luck, Beth. Uh, hopefully this helps. Uh, seminar coming up for a meal. Uh, TA tutorials for Jerry Biocam. Cool. Uh, Vanessa has a pre recorded conference presentation. Um, so, Vanessa, have you already done that or uh, have you, uh, are you still uh, preparing for that? Already done. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that, that is weird, like to pre-record a conference presentation. That, this is the world that we live in. Uh, we're going to talk about conferences a little bit later on because this gets into our, into our audience committee meeting. Uh, Teresa Law recently gave a talk for class of WebEx and there was no longer an option to use presenter notes on PowerPoint, which wasn't ideal. Ah, Teresa, I've got a tip for you. So what I have done, because yes, I don't have presenter notes um, because I'm sharing uh, the PowerPoint. But what I've done is that I've opened a separate PowerPoint so that I can, uh, I can flip my screen and I still have my presenter notes. Or as a backup, I also have a second computer right next to me where I also have my presenter notes. But because I wanna keep focused on the camera, I would much rather have my notes on my screen rather than down here, because then I'm looking down here and I'm, I'm looking at my notes. So um, I actually just figured out, um, actually uh, today actually, um, that I could just open up a separate, um, and I'm using, uh, I'm using Google Slides actually. So I just opened up a second Google Slides in the presenter view there, but I'm also just sharing a separate one that's full screen. So that, uh, Teresa, might be able to, uh, to help you out uh, if you want to keep your notes and also present full screen. Uh, would you actually ever stand up to give a Zoom talk lecture instead of sit? Good question, Beth. Um, yeah, why not? I think you could totally stand. Um, the same uh, principles still apply, though. You still want to have your eyes on that same level. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very hands talker, so that's something to be to be aware of are you a hands talker um i would encourage it if you are because there's there's all those little subtle cues when you're up on stage and you're talking in front of an audience and um one of my favorite tricks actually when giving a public talk and we're actually going to get into that a little bit later on but i might as well just say it now is uh, about pacing and that's where you kind of like okay I've given you all of my information. Now I'm gonna give you the real important part here, but I'm gonna to wanna to change up the pace now. So I'm gonna walk away from the computer and if you have a wireless microphone, you can do this and then you could like start to pace the stage. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I know that profs like to do it a lot. They kind of like, just go for a wander. You know, maybe uh, go a little bit closer to the students. Uh, one of my favorite moves is the rock star move uh, that we maybe that I'd see somebody do on uh, Nerd Night, which is to uh, put the uh, put your leg up on the on the monitor on stage and you know and really lean in here. I'm like, okay, 
want to, here's what I want to talk about here. Um, so standing gives you those options that you can play with a little bit of your body chemistry. Um, and hands is an important uh, way to emphasize some things. If you can set up your, uh, your laptop so that you're on that level, uh, and not too big, so you don't want to be like way far away standing, um, th that, that would feel a bit weird to me. Um, you, so you'd have to remember to, I think, stay kind of like rooted in like a little tiny little circle and not go wandering too far because then you're going to wander away from, um, uh, from the main camera. Uh, but that's a great question, uh, Beth. Uh, any other questions uh, about uh, the technical setting up your setting up your system, getting ready um, to look your best and feel your best. Confidence is such a big thing when giving a talk, and um, doing the little things like this, testing your system, just helps to sort of alleviate a lot of those nerves. Because uh, I tell you, I've been doing this uh, for oh, 25 years, and I still get nervous. And the point when you stop getting nervous is when you maybe think like. Mm, Maybe, they, maybe I, I need to change it up a bit. Maybe I need to find uh, a different career because those nerves help you. Um, they help elevate you to the level um, that, your, uh, that where your audience is um, or else you're just, just having a chat with your friend on the couch. But that's not what we're doing here when we're giving our presentations, right? Uh, Teresa asked, uh, how do you share the first PowerPoint without showing the second PowerPoint open for your notes? So I believe yeah, you just... Um, can you open up a separate PowerPoint? Um, it might be different in Google Slides because I've just opened up Google Slides into a separate window. So that's where I have the, uh, the notes there. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to practice that. In power, if so a PowerPoint is a program, you can't actually open up a second program. Hmm. I'm gonna get back to you on that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play around with that, Teresa, and see if, uh, see if that works. Uh, okay, any other questions? Maybe Lorenzo uh, or anyone back there, maybe, uh, maybe you want to practice that uh, um, and see if we can answer Teresa's question. Can you open a separate uh, PowerPoint uh, tab? Uh, Hassan says dual screens of presenter view and second screen on Zoom. Yeah. All right, how's everyone feeling? We're at 12.24. Whoa, that was, that was good. We're going to just have to zoom through this. I didn't mean that for it to be a pun. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, Lorenzo. Yeah, uh, Google Slides. That's what I. That's what I do as well. Okay, let's move. Let's move on because we're gonna we're gonna get to get through this. We've got a lot lot to cover here. Um, we're gonna get to uh, audience. This is uh, this is our big um, big sort of core thing here. So for most of you, you're grad students, and I would assume, you know, you're, you're, giving, um, you're giving your presentations to the same groups of people. Uh, but the thing to understand is that there's no such thing as the general public when it comes to audiences. Uh, as you go into, into your careers, you'll be giving more and different kinds of presentations. But you have to understand that every audience is unique and comprised of different demographics and viewpoints. And these groups differ not only in their prior knowledge of a subject, but also their motivations for learning. So you got to do your research. So how do, what does that look like? Well, um, when the team, you know, came to me and uh, wanted uh, SciCast to do this presentation, you know, I asked them questions, you know, what were, who was going to come? And so mostly grad students, they're mostly on their breaks. Okay. So how was, uh, how has their life been affected? You know, what is their, where is their level of understanding with science communication? These are kind of like the research questions that I would do uh, about my audience. The tricky thing though, is that when you do an online presentation, it's, especially for the public, if you're just like, hey everyone, just come on and join in for this workshop, hope to hope, uh, see if we can gather as many people as we can. You're not going to know some of that information because they're just gonna show up. And normally when I teach my science communicators, we have an hourly show. We don't know who's gonna be walking through those doors every hour. So we tell them to stand there right at the front there and greet people as they're coming in. Hey, how's it going? You know, and then if you have a chance to like chit chat with them, just to try to find any amount of information you can glean from them. How much do they know? What were their motivations for coming? Um, 
those little bits of information um, will really help to tailor your talk specifically to that audience. Uh, and, you're, and if you're developing an elevator style pitch, make it widely accessible. No matter the age, background, culture of the audience, if you're a guest speaker, reach out to the organizers to get an audience profile, which is kind of what I talked about. Okay, so we talked about uh, being online. Um, you know, take the extra time to be clear, be professional, prepare as much as you can for all of these different kinds of audiences. We got a graphic here of uh, these different characters. Uh, shout out to our side cat, Armin, uh, who does all of our science tuning, as he likes to call it. He's the, if you uh, want to look him up, he's Armin, the science tunist. Uh, he does a lot of our uh, illustrations. Um, you know, and once you're here and you're like, well, I only know a little bit about the audience, just roll with it. You're gonna le learn a little bit of more information, ask questions, especially early on, and as you go along, which is kind of what I've done here, see if you can also glean some information about your audience as you do. And if you need to adjust on the fly, then you need to do that. You know, one of the things that I think we can all appreciate now in doing these presentations online is that we're all a little bit stressed and it's weird and it's different and uh, technical things go wrong all the time. We'll, we'll be forgiving um, if you need to kind of like adjust and if things go a little bit funny, um, we'll figure it out. Uh, that's something that I have really appreciated because there's been many times over the past few months when I've been giving online talks, something's gone wrong, something's gone like horrendously wrong. One time we had uh, over 400 people, uh, we're at Star Wars Day actually, at the Space Center, May the 4th, and my Zoom crashed. Like all of a sudden, like I was just like completely frozen and I had to like restart my computer and come back in. It was awkward, you know, but I texted my colleague, just keep asking questions, stall, you know, and then I came back and, and people were okay with it. They were like, hey, Zoom crashed, you know, uh, how many times a day does your program crash? Almost everyone. Staying focused is uh, going to be a tricky one as well. How do I keep you engaged? If I was standing in front of you, you know, I would uh, be looking at you in the eye. Uh, some of you have your cameras on, some of you don't. Um, and I understand that, you know, this is the middle of your workday. Uh, you're, you're on lunch, maybe some of you are eating while you're listening to this, uh, this conversation. So that's totally cool, you know. But I have that in the back of my mind that I wanna try to stay focused. I wanna try to keep you focused. Um, and at the end of the day, I know that giving an online presentation is not ideal, but uh, the more that you do it, the more practice we're gonna get into uh, the key that you want, which is, um, is to practice and try out these new tools and tech. Another really key thing that, we can, uh, that you can do is that even in this presentation, uh, Lorenzo and the team here are in the background, they're monitoring the chat, they're kind of helping me out. If something went wrong, you know, they would text me or something. Uh, normally we'd have a couple side cats here, just having like a few other people, as you can sort of see uh, in the, uh, on the screen here, we've got sort of like this cheerleader uh, that kind of like helps encourage um, the main speaker, the moderator person, and they can really help. They can really help sort of like keep you focused, uh, have somebody to check in. Um, you know, I can throw it to Lorenzo, like, hey, Lorenzo, could you like maybe just do a little uh, background here? Um, because something could go wrong, something good tech person could go wrong, but having that other person also monitor the chat. Now, I don't know if any of you at some point will be giving, you know, public talks where you're going live to YouTube or live to Facebook. Uh, those are new things that have come into our vocabulary. Um, but a tip is that you can't always monitor the chat because quite often, you know, I'm encouraging you to chat, but I'm not reading the chat as I'm speaking. So something may come up in the chat that's very important, but that moderator person is sort of looking at that and they're like, oh, that's a really key point. Maybe they want to uh, jump in and ask me a question about that before I move on from it. Or, as has happened, Maybe it's inappropriate. I, we, we, in YouTube the other, um, the other week, you know, it was, I don't know what it was. It was something in the water, but everyone that came to our YouTube live was just, you know, it was all eggplant emojis. And I was like, what is going on? You know, <laughs> but in YouTube and in Facebook, you can moderate that. You can put people on timeouts. Um, because remember, uh, everyone in there that's, that's here with us, 
um, they're seeing that as well. And that could be a distraction. So that moderator person to moderate that chat is a really key thing. So it's a team effort. Um, you can imagine, you know, if I was preparing for a talk and I was going to give it in the auditorium, um, I'm not going to go into the auditorium, set up all the chairs, set up all of the microphones. Hopefully you would have, you know, a tech person there to kind of like help with some of those things. Um, you wouldn't be doing that on your own. So don't think that you have to do it on your own. Reach out to some of your colleagues um, and uh, have some people help you out. Um, so very quickly, I just want to t uh, talk about very specifically about who a virtual audience might be. And a technique that we have developed at SciCast is to visualize a very specific audience person. So for this example, we're going to talk about the elephant. Okay, so here we are, SciCats, that's SciCat Julie there, uh, the cat, that's our um, cat mascot. And the scientist, the elephant here is a scientist, they're working at home, they're living with their parents, their partner, and while they want to be doing an awesome job, it's life is a bit stressful right now. They're worried about the world, their job, and how their work is going. They miss their research colleagues, their lab. And why are they tuning in today? Well, they're looking for a quick, good webinar with some tools and tricks they want to use to uh, do a better job at home. And they have a presentation coming up, um, and they're using this time, this is their work time. It, it looks good for them to show up. So, but there's all of that background sort of like stress right now that's in you know, new right now. And I understand that, um, that all of you perhaps are a little bit stressed and, you know, the world is, um, you know, it's going through some major changes right now. And you don't want to ignore that. You have to understand where your audience is. Um, you don't have to talk about those things, but as long as you understand them, that gives you the context for that specific audience member. And you're going to talk to them like a real person. You're not just talking to uh, a computer. It's, it's a little trick of the brain. You're like, I'm just talking to a computer. Like, no, you're actually talking to a bunch of real people that have real lives and have real emotions. And think about that person, that elephant, when you're developing your talk. Okay. So. Uh, did you change slides? Just wondering, because it still says understanding your audience. Oh. Okay. Now, now we can see that. Yeah. There we go. See, perfect example. Lorenzo jumped in, uh, wasn't changing my slides. <laughs> Thanks, Lorenzo. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I'll quickly go. These are all of our side tunist friends here. Here's, uh, here's us trying to keep uh, attention. There's our moderator. Here's our elephant. That's our audience member. That's you. That's you ready to give your awesome presentation, okay? Um, what does the audience already know? I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of like skip uh, through this a lot and just sort of get to this, uh, this point here, which is um, you have to remember that not everyone tuning in uh, to your presentation may be local. Um, this is another lesson that I've learned is that when you're on the internet, you're giving a presentation, you now have a global audience. It's very different. Um, think about those different audiences, think about their specific needs. Um, is this pre-recorded? Is, is this a live recording? Um, all those things kind of like go into how you're going to prepare. And that sort of like leads us into um, this slide here, which is uh, another real core uh, piece of information um, in what kind of talk you're going to give. Is it a group meeting? Is it a conference? Is it a public talk? Okay, so as you can see, if you're giving a group meeting, what you want to focus in on are your methods and results. They already know who you are. They're not so interested in the conclusions, but this group meeting is, is like they're there with you. They want to know um, how you got there. If you're giving a public talk, they don't know you at all. So you do want to focus in on your background. And ultimately, they want the big impact. That's really kind of like um, what it is that you're, that you're studying um, and uh, how it's going to affect them. Because they may not be in your field. You are telling them your science and your giving them the most important things that may be relevant to them. When you go to a conference, you know, conferences, you can sort of see how the conferences have small bubbles there. That's because you have to think about what happens at a conference. It's multiple talks. It's talk, talk, talk. There are so many talks at a conference. You'll see more <laughs> talks than ever when you go to a conference. So you got to get right to the point. 
short, sweet, get right to the point. People are listening to a lot of information. So skim on the background, skim on the methods and results, conclusions, get right to that conclusion and uh, have more of a dialogue. You know, the most important things about conferences I find for the ones that I go to are the interactions and meeting people and having conversations. That's where the real big impact comes from. But if you want to start, if you want to get to that conversation quicker, um, a key thing is don't belabor your, your conference talk, get right to it um, and get to those conclusions so that you can have uh, a good discussion around them. Okay, what time we got here? We have 12.37. Uh, we're gonna get, get right to this. Do we have any more questions about audience? I have one last section that I'm gonna get to um, before we end today. Anyone have any questions about audience? I'm gonna take a little water break here. I imagine most of you are sort of like all in the same boat in terms of the types of presentations that you are giving. But this is uh, good information when you start going to conferences, if you start going to public talks, when Nerd Night comes back uh, online and we're at the, uh, the Fox Cabaret again, I encourage you all to, uh, to message us and to uh, apply to be uh, one of our speakers. Um, Nerd Night is a great place to interact with the general public. And the general public are the ones that you, know, that you measure a lot of your uh, real success as a science communicator. I always think of it as um, you walk into a bar and you see some friends, but there's some new people that your friends have brought along and you don't know them and they see you and like, hey, Michael, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm gonna tell you what, I, what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna have a conversation about, about what it is that I do, but I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, the methods and results. I'm going to really get to the heart of it and I'm going to try to make what I sound, what the work that I do, relevant to the person that's sitting there in a conversational style. Um, that's what kind of what, what Nerd Night is. It's having science conversations um, in a non-conventional place like a bar. Um, I find it really effective. Okay, 12.39, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna get right to it here. We're gonna turn your good presentation into a great online presentation. And like I said at the top, um, I don't think that I would consider myself, um, you know, a, a, a pro at giving a great uh, online presentation. Each and every time that I give a presentation, uh, I always have an opportunity for it to fail. Uh, and those are the little nerves inside uh, that kind of uh, that pump me up. Because you want to do your best. And I've given you some of the tools to think about getting your uh, screen set up. We now understand our audience. Now, what else can we do? Okay, here's one tip. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Title your presentation. Give it a very specific title for exactly what it is they're gonna be talking about. And what I mean by that is that don't title your presentation The Grapes of Wrath. The Grapes of Wrath is, um, is, a, is literature that is full of metaphors. You don't want metaphors in your talk. You wanna get right to the point. And a really good thing is to title your presentation, like we presentation here, how to give a good online talk. That's the title of this uh, presentation, online science communication. That means everything that I'm talking about relates back to that title. If you don't know the Grapes of Wrath is an allegory in the Bible, it tells you nothing about what Grapes of the Wrath is. Um, so that's, uh, that's tip number one. Tip number two, avoid text. Now at the, uh, at the Fox Cabaret, um, it, when you would come, there's a big screen, you know, and it's a long skinny room, but there's a lot of light in there and, you know, people are way at the back and we'd always kind of like tell people, well, the projector's not that great. Um, don't use text. Text is just something for somebody to uh, avoid listening to you. Right, it's your, you do, when you put text onto your screen, they're just gonna read everything and they're still gonna stop listening to you. So the only text that you want on there is the most important information um, or even the title uh, of your slides, um, especially online. I assume most of you are on a laptop, but 
perhaps you're on a phone. Think about like your screen and you're looking at your text. Um, when you're doing online science communication, text is, is not going to be good. Uh, okay. Next thing here. I'm going to stop sharing here. And the next technique that you can do is remember I was giving those, those tips of doing the walk, doing the old strut across the stage. You don't have many of those techniques, but what you could do is you could stop screen sharing and just come right back and talk directly to your audience. And I was doing an interview the other day, my, my boss at the Space Center, she was describing to me uh, a really good interview. Uh, it was a prof at McGill in, in Montreal, and she really liked how she leaned in a little closer. And it was a little, a little intimate, but she did it to really make a point. And you can also see, because I'm closer to the microphone, uh, you can really hear my voice uh, pick up a bit more. Now I'm a little bit closer to the microphone, and maybe I'm a little bit off uh, on my things, but I'm gonna come back and that was just a tiny little shift. I've stopped screen sharing, and now is my time to kind of change the momentum. We're 45 minutes in here for our presentation, uh, and some of you, maybe you've eaten your, uh, your lunch and you're maybe crashing a bit, maybe losing focus a bit. What are my other techniques to kind of change up that pacing, change up the energy? You know, that's what you want. You don't want a one note presentation. You want to, so you want to have a crescendo and then you're going to, going to come down here. But depending on how much time you have, you want to make sure that you ramp back up. So a little uh, technique that I found um, in this new um, coronavirus, as I like to call it, when we're all doing online presentations, you're sharing the screen, but they're not looking at me. They're just looking at the screen. So if I want to deliver some information, I don't have any slides to, su to support what I'm saying, just stop screen sharing and come back. And then you can always go back to screen sharing. Next tip, mimic. Find your favorite science communicator. And if you have um, a favorite science communicator for yourself, throw it uh, up there in the chat. I'd love to hear uh, who all your favorites are. Uh, maybe it's uh, Bill Nye. Maybe it's uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Maybe it's Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, she's actually been one of my favorites uh, recently. For me, growing up, it's Carl Sagan. And uh, I know a lot of you... Uh, uh, may not remember Carl Sagan, he's been dead uh, for a while, but of course he was the originator of Cosmos. And for me, uh, he was really important because he spoke very eloquently. He was very poetic with his words and he spoke with intent and purpose. And he paused because he knew that his audience was learning things about the universe for the first time. And when you're talking about the universe, things that are magical, that you can't see, you want your audience to visualize. So when you slow down your speech, and for me, I'm gonna stop doing my Carl Sagan impression, but for me, a problem that I still have is that I speak too quickly and I always have to remember to slow down and think about the words, what I wanna say, and then speak with intent especially when you want to get to the heart of your message, the theme of what you want the audience to take away with. And when you're starting off and you're figuring out how do I do this? You know, how did Carl Sagan, you know, get to that point where he had a TV show? He practiced. So that's my main takeaway for you all, you know, try some things out. And I know that you're, you're just, if you're just starting your science communication career, um, Try to find avenues. You know, there's lots of opportunities out there. There's Science Slam. There's a Pint of Science. Uh, there's, of course, Nerd Night. Lots of opportunities. Perhaps you have some grad groups uh, where you can practice with each other. Maybe just grab a couple of friends as you're preparing for your presentation. Like, hey, do you want to practice our presentations for each other? That's really the only way that you can, that you can get there. And nobody is going, to be, is going to get good at something right away. Practice is the only way. And if you use that mimicking technique, you know, for me, that was just something that I'm not actually speaking like Carl Sagan when I'm giving presentations, but it's always kind of like in the back of my mind. All right, one last point, and then we're gonna finish off here. So one module um, that we do in SciCats, we don't have, obviously have time to get into, but it's a very core piece is uh, telling your science as a story. 
And that's essentially what I've been doing here in this presentation is that I've been telling a story as I've been telling you about the science of giving a good online talk. And the Wizard of Oz is a really good example of what I want you to take away with. Because I started you off with setting up your screen and giving you the confidence, the bravery of the lion. Then we went into understanding your audience and doing some research, using your brain before you get into the talk, which is the scarecrow. And this last piece to come full circle to how to make your good talk a great talk is to find what the Tin Man is looking for, and that's what's inside here. You, you are a real person. You have emotions. You, are you interested in, are you passionate about what you're talking about? Show that to us. Show the real person who you are. Because you don't want to learn from a robot. You don't want to read a Wikipedia article. You don't want to watch a YouTube, uh, another YouTube uh, channel. You want to hear from a real human being. So, and that again takes practice. It takes bravery. But if you can sort of dig deep in there and find sort of that thing that, that you think is really special and important about what you're talking about, um, the audience will relate to it. People always relate to a real human as opposed to a robot. So that is all that I have for now. What time do we got? 12.48, woo, I zoomed through that. Um, let's, have a, let's have a chat, let's, uh, let's talk with you all. I'd love to uh, hear from you and uh, see what you're thinking. Some of you are preparing for talks, some of you are, are in the middle of uh, preparing for talks. I have already given talks. Uh, hopefully you are uh, preparing for more talks. Um, uh, Beth, a colleague told me once some of the can't easily read and listen simultaneously in prides, avoid non-essential text. Yeah, uh, reading and talking is, uh, is something that I would always avoid. If you can, don't read your notes. I know that your notes are there to give you your backup. They're your safety net. And I'm not saying don't bring your notes. You bring your notes as your backup in case you lose your, lose, your, uh, lose your place. There have been many times that I have been up on stage and I just completely blank. And <laughs> if that happens, if you're in the middle of a presentation and your brain just goes blank, I don't know what, the, there might be a medical term for it where you're like, um, you get blood, too much in your head and just like flush and all of a sudden you get nervous and you don't even have a single thought in your head. You can't even say anything. Just take a deep breath and you can look at somebody in the eye and just pause. If you pause, even smile too, nobody's going to think that you've missed anything. And eventually maybe you take a look at your notes, figure out where you are, and then come right back into it. Um, not panicking is, uh, it's easy to say, don't panic. Uh, take a sip of water, take a deep breath, look at your notes, come right back to where, to where you are. Uh, if you're reading your notes, people aren't going to listen. It's the same thing. You might as well just put up a text uh, if you're going to read off your notes. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a skill uh, that you would need to have, you know, reading off a teleprompter because that's not what we do. You know, when you see politicians give speeches, there's like a big teleprompter right behind the camera. So they can look right at the camera and they can read and they practice uh, reading, but it never really seems right to me. It, it seems stilted. It seems scripted and I don't like it. I like when people just talk to me. Uh, like Bonnie Henry does. Bonnie Henry doesn't read off a teleprompter. She's reading off her notes but you'll notice that when she's giving her presentations, she's got a lot of heart. She's got a lot of warmth to her because she knows that's a big part of what her purpose there is, is to make people feel a little bit less stressed. Uh, and there's a lot of really important information that she's sharing, but she knows that if she was just reading off a teleprompter, that would seem cold and people wouldn't trust her anymore. And trust is a big part of her job. And I think in general, you know, the public have this, people that aren't in science, there, there's a divide. And we want to try to break down that, that divide of trust between the general public and science communicators. Um, and I think what that part of that is, is sort of breaking down the facade of, you know, I'm the expert and I'm talking to the non-experts. No, 
We are having a discussion. I have some information I'd like to share with you. You have some, uh, some thoughts and some perspectives that I may not have thought about, and I would love to hear about that. Um, and that's part of uh, our jobs as science communicators is to break down that divide. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, do, 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 do. Vanessa says, a tip I was told is to memorize the first thing you are going to say very well. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what that, what, what would be the, the, the first thing that you're, that you're going to say very well, Vanessa? I'd be here. I'm curious to, uh, to hear uh, what that first thing would be. Um, yeah, I think about that. Uh, think about that a lot. You want to practice, Vanessa, with all, well, with all of us? Practice? Yeah. That, that oh, first thing, did you memorize it? Sometimes it's just like, welcome everybody to my talk. It's titled blah, blah, blah. But yeah, at my first in real life conference, I like got up to the podium and just totally <laughs> blanked. I don't think I could say a single thing for like 10 seconds. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. How do, you start, how do you start off your talk? And I find um, before you even say that, Vanessa, I would just welcome the audience, say hello, just like you would in a conversation, look people in the eye, and maybe you are going to feel a bit of nerves, you know, that, that first thing they get up there. So just greet them and maybe, you know, before you get into kind of talking about yourself, you know, um, just have like a little chit chat, almost like a little icebreaker with the audience. Um, maybe there was something that you could reference in the previous talk, you know, like maybe something funny or, um, maybe you're, you're in a different city and you're talking about I don't know, the weather or something, or, you know, quite often these days in the online talks, it's just talking about all the news or like, um, the stressfulness of being in, now in my kitchen or, or things like that. Um, just a little bit of an icebreaker, just to chat with the audience and, I think once you do that, and maybe if you ask a couple questions right off the top and get people in the audience speaking before you need to talk, um, maybe that'll give you a little bit of confidence before you launch into it. And then you'd be like, all right, my name's Beth. Um, here's what I do, and here's what, uh, here's what I like to talk about. Um, sing happy birthday song twice. <laughs> yeah. Comprehensive exams. Oof. I've never actually taken a comprehensive exam, so I don't know if, uh, if, if I'm the right person to, uh, to talk about that. Um, who's been taking comp comprehensive exams and wants to talk about uh, their experiences in a comprehensive exam? Beth, go for it. I had my comp on Thursday. Um, so it, it was via Zoom, which was a bit weird, but I didn't really find it different than like, nerves at a regular committee meeting, um, the fact that it was over Zoom, but yeah, I'm not sure if there's any tips I can give so <laughs> other what, than what, what you've already said about presentations. What made, it, what made the comprehensive exam different than like a regular talk that you may give? Um, well, the presentation part is actually not like it doesn't take up most of the comprehensive exam. That's only the first 20 minutes. And then the remainder of the three hours will be them asking you questions. Right. Uh, I prepared a lot of possible slides that are, that address like questions they might ask. Mm -hmm. So I found, I resorted to those a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It sort of sounds like um, you're kind of preparing for like an interview, essentially like a comprehensive exam is kind of like, um, they're going to ask you about everything that you know. I guess that's the point of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've actually seen my friend uh, Miranda, uh, who I'm sure she has taken comprehensive exams, but um, she was in a job interview and she kind of like uh, showed behind the scenes what her setup was like. And what she did was she kind of plastered a bunch of like notes on the wall. <laughs> so instead of like flipping through your computer, they just, she just had like big sort of like printouts. Um, and she taped them on the wall. She can kind of just like go over there if she needed to kind of try to access uh, information uh, really quickly. And then of course, maybe you have um, extra laptop or maybe an iPad or something. Um, because yeah, a comprehensive exam would mean 
They could be ans asking you all sorts of different kinds of questions that you need to access. Sounds stressful. I've never taken one before, but. <laughs> yeah, it's stressful. Um, and just reminded me of another thing that really helped. So at a regular comprehensive exam, they often ask you questions and they want you to draw out what they're, what they are asking. Mm -hmm. um, so I also included my iPad to the Zoom call. Yeah. So if I needed to draw something, I could draw it on my iPad and share a screen with that. That helps. That great. I only had to do that like once, but still. Yeah, great example. I had a question for Vanessa. Um, did you have feedback when you had your iPad connected to the same call? No, I, I, I didn't have the audio connected. Oh, okay, perfect, okay. And I will do that. <laughs> Thanks. So you had, Teresa, you had feedback um, when you connected the iPad? No, because there was, oh, sorry, not me. What? No, no, no. I was just wondering because if you have two devices oh, connected right, yeah. to the audio, but if you have audio off, it's probably fine. Yeah. Awesome, folks. How's everyone feeling? You better get right back to work. <laughs> Um, yeah. Thanks, folks. Um, well, thank I guess, you, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, thanks, Grass Pods, uh, for, uh, for bringing me uh, here. Of course, uh, if you want to uh, ask me any more questions or actually want to follow anything that SciCats does, uh, Twitter is the best place for that, at SciCatsYBR. Um, you can find uh, our, our podcast, Nerd Night, out. Uh, uh, which are still Nerd Night y at Nerd Night YVR. Uh, that's where we post our podcast information. Of course, the Space Center. Um, we're live on YouTube every Thursday. Uh, we got an interview with uh, Jeremy Hansen, who's an astronaut, this uh, this Thursday at two o'clock. If anyone wants to uh, to see that. Um, but thank you all for for joining uh, me here today. I had a blast. Uh, hope, good luck for all of your presentations, your comprehensive exams. Uh, I'm always open for any questions. If anyone wants to hit me up um, and uh, get some advice, I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, my workload has uh, is diminished a bit in these last little bits, so I've got more time in my hands than I, than I used to, but I uh, love chatting with you folks.